Teach me good judgment and discernment, for I rely on your commands. Before I was afflicted, I went astray. Isn't it amazing? I just think of that verse. Before I was afflicted, I went astray. In other words, something happened in my life that, that, that stopped me from in my tracks. It could be in a sickness, a depression, a letdown, uh, a fearful moment, and a moment of sobriety. You know, something came into your life that caused you, that God caused you to reflect more solidly upon the life you were living, what you were doing with your life. And, uh, you know, the Bible calls those moments not judgments, but they call it wounds of a friend. It's more like a surgeon having to go in with a knife, not to do you harm, but actually to do you good. So the afflictions that come upon us are oftentimes of testing, oftentimes to sober us up, to get our thinking because we are so easily gone astray. But he does say, Lord, you have treated your servant well. And I hope tonight, before we come worship the Lord, that you can say whatever day you've had or whatever situation you face in your life, you can still say, Lord, you have treated your servant well. You, you've treated me far greater than what I deserve to be treated. And uh, it's not the greatest, greatest of days. It's not the worst of days. It's just a day today. But you have treated me well. Can you say that tonight with great conviction? Lord, you've treated me well. You've treated your servant well. You've treated me far better than I treat, treated others. You have forgiven me all my sin, and yet I hold, I hold things in my heart against other people. You have lavished love upon me, yet I'm very selected in who I lavish my love upon. You have surrounded me with good things, and yet I'm selfish to others. You're very good to me, Lord. Will you stand with me tonight and just as we reflect uh, in the presence of a wonderful God, we can say as we worship, we can say before we worship, Lord, you have treated your servant well. Hallelujah. Will you close your eyes with me, those online? We welcome you tonight into the presence of the Lord. Come worship with us as we're worshiping him here in Court Church. Make that space wherever you are, in your car, in your living room. You might have an apartment somewhere. You might be on a subway. You might be on a bus listening to this. But make it a holy place. Uh, close your eyes for a moment and just say, Lord, you've treated your servant well. And I want to praise you with all my heart. You have forgiven me all my sins. You have washed me in the precious blood of Jesus. You have given me the Holy Spirit. You have given me eternal life. You have brought me into a family, a church community, a, a good body, Lord, a good group of people this morning, tonight, Lord. And we thank you for that. Thank you, Lord, for the provisions that you have made thus far for my journey. And Lord, I won't doubt you that you won't provide tomorrow. But I thank you for today, Lord, what you have provided. And when tomorrow comes, I'm going to trust you that you'll do the same tomorrow. And we bless the holy name of Jesus. We worship. Come on, just worship where you're standing tonight. Just say how much you love him, how grateful you are to him. Hallelujah. Oh, we bless the holy name of Jesus. We want to worship you, Lord. We want your presence to fill our hearts, oh God. We want our praises to rise to you, Jesus, because you are a good Lord. And we bless you. We thank you. We ask you to have this time tonight, Lord that all our praise and worship will go to you, Lord, that your presence will descend, Lord. We will hear from your word. We will leave built up, God. I pray even tonight that someone will be saved, oh God. Someone will be healed. Someone will be restored, oh God. Someone will be transformed by the presence and power of God. I pray, Lord, that miracles will happen. The prayers will be answered, oh God. I pray faith will rise in the hearts of your church, God. Both here and those online, oh God, that we will begin to reach to the heavens tonight, Lord, and say, Lord, you're always good, Lord. And why should we not go into your presence rejoicing, knowing that you heard every prayer and you will answer every prayer with a yes and amen. Receive all the honor. Receive all the glory now, we pray in Jesus' lovely name. Hallelujah. Let's worship the Lord together. Praise his lovely name. Hallelujah, Lord.
There is a king that we adore With humble hearts we bow before Lord, take your seats for a few moments tonight. Amen. You might just stay here, guys. Tiwa is going to come up. She's going to share how the old was made new. Amen. Can you give her a clap tonight? She's going to testify what the Lord has done in our life. I just asked her a few minutes ago, and I love it. was an immediate yes in her heart because she loves the Lord. Just share what the Lord has done, how you became a Christian, 
how the old was made new. God bless you. Amen. Good evening, everyone. Um, I think I feel. I think um, I see my walk, my Christian walk, as a continuous journey. It's never really been. Um, I mean, there were moments in my life where I made the decision to follow the Lord, um, and honestly, He's continually making things new in my life. He's continually um, forgiven my sins. He's continually amazing me with His grace. Um, and you know, when Pastor Nick said today, um, the verse you read you've been good to your servant lord i can truly testify of that that goodness of god over my life um every time every time um and it's just something that i really know from the depths of my being um my walk has been i said like i became a christian properly i was raised in a christian home but i decided to follow god um at school um, and I joined the Christian Union and I just remember walking with a group of people who loved the Lord and we followed the Lord as enthusiastically as, as any teenager who just heard about the Lord and is like, oh my gosh, you know, I made that decision to go forward with him. And I have honestly never looked back. It's been the best decision of my life. Um, it's what I'm anchored upon. There's, you cut me open and it's just, it's everything to me. So that's just, that's the truth about God making my life um, and my my walk daily renewing it um, you know pro probably sometimes when you think you've nailed this Christian thing there's something else you know to do but there's grace and there's love of God that I always find at the end of that and um, yeah I'm looking forward to a lifetime of just you know loving God walking with him and him just continually making me new and into his image amen Come on, Jacinta, just share it, because most people don't know your testimony. A very brief version, the old made new, because I'm just inspired by that song. He takes us out of a dead grave and gives us new life. God bless you, girl. Come on. I know you're going to kill me. I'm her brother-in-law, so she's going to really give out to me later on. Yeah, well, I suppose I gave my life to the Lord when I was really small. I think I was about four or five. And I can say, well, he's, just, he's helped me through everything, everything in my life. And he's been so, so good. And even... Um, just even through just trials and situations that you thought would never happen, you know, and, and you kind of, you're waiting on God to see if there's an answer. And, you know, he, like, I just encourage you tonight that he does answer, that he is, he's so faithful and he's been so good to me. I don't deserve anything he's given me. And I, even I look back, I look at my five children and, oh my goodness, I'm so blessed. I was just thinking the other day, I'm so blessed to have five beautiful children, four boys, a beautiful daughter that God gave us, and a wonderful husband. And I just thank him, my life, where would, where would we be without him? Nowhere, just, and yes, yeah, I just thank him so much for everything that he's done in my life. I praise him, he's a wonderful God, a wonderful savior. And he never lets us down, never. And I just encourage you tonight just to seek after him. And I just thank him, I give him thanks tonight. Yeah. And the worship again. Praise the Lord. I just wanted your hearts to be overjoyed tonight because he has been very good to his servants. Amen. I said he's been very good to us. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm sorry I just jumped in and brought me there. But <laughs> it's Wednesday night. We can do whatever we want. Amen. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. The Lord bless you. Let's worship. shelter I was in north now you call me a citizen of heaven when I was broken you are my healing and your love gives me air that I'm breathing I have the future my eyes are open now you call my name
worship you, our Lord. You are worthy to be praised. Thank you. Let's sing that again. You are Alpha and Omega. We worship you, our Lord. You are worthy to be praised. Come on, let's give him everything. Jesus. Jesus. Thank you, Lord. And all the saints and angels bow before your throne. before the Lamb of God and sing. Let's sing all the saints and angels. And all the saints and angels they bow, bow before the throne. And all the others cast and all the elders cast their crown
Lord in prayer before we transition out of worship tonight. Amen. And you know, there's some real needs here tonight, and and I hope you don't mind me sharing. But we need to pray for Deepak and Rena, and we need to pray for a miracle from them tonight. Amen. And uh, you know, I'm going to ask some of the men just to go and stand with them and lay hands on them. Just go there tonight and just lay your hands on them, brothers. Go over and pray. Jerry, you too. Alfonso, you go pray. Kevin, you go pray as well. Lay hands on them tonight, amen. They just need a miracle. Don't need to go into a lot of details tonight. They need God to move. Hallelujah. We love this family. They're, they're, they, they've been here like a year or not even that, and it feels like they were forever part of the DNA of this church. Uh, but you just pray for them, Lord. Lord, you know the need. Lord, we, we implore you for them, Lord. We come before you. We ask you, Lord, that you give them a great miracle. We ask you, Lord, that you do something that only you can do. Lord, they, they are a devoted couple. You know their hearts. You know the family, Lord. You brought them here for purpose, Lord. And Lord, I just pray, Jesus, that this week there'll be a breakthrough. In the name of Jesus. This week there'll be a breakthrough, Lord. This week, Lord, they'll have an answer from heaven. They will have the direction, oh God. They will know exactly what's, what you're saying, Lord, and what you're doing. And they will have an answer, Lord. Open up the doors, I pray, for, a, for employment for this man, oh God, so that they can stay here in this country, Lord. Thank you, Lord. He's a very gifted man, Lord. He's a very, very gifted man. And I pray you again, we just encourage him to pack in his very heart tonight, Lord. Lord. It's not his fault in any level. This is the purpose and plan of God, to show yourself mighty and powerful in his life. Now I just pray, Lord, and for others that might be struggling in the, in the house, Lord, who might be carrying health issues, Lord, uh, strife issues, family issues, maybe dealing with depression or fear. I pray, Holy Spirit, you come and just bring your grace upon them. Touch them powerfully, Lord God. There's some who are away from home. They're missing their families, Lord God. And they're brokenhearted. They have a loved one that's sick in a foreign land today, Lord. I pray you minister your grace to them, Father. And I thank you again, Lord, that you're with us here tonight at Court Church. Your presence is here. I sense you, Holy Spirit. Thank you. Thank you for being so good to your servants, Lord. Thank you for hearing us, Lord. We praise you, Lord Jesus. We bless you, Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. God bless you tonight. Amen. Just before you take your seats, go and welcome someone to the, Lord, to the church tonight. Praise God. There's a wonderful young lady here. She's got a Nicola as her name. So she's got a great name because it's like Pastor Nick. It's a, you shake hands with her tonight. God bless you. God bless you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Anybody here? Anybody here visiting for, into the church for the first time? Is this your first time at Cork Church? Wave up. This is your first time. God bless you. You're so welcome. The Lord bless you. What's your name? Vinicius. Vinicius from Brazil. Yeah. Oh, well, how did I guess that? Okay. Vinicius, you're very welcome. God bless you. Lovely having you here. There's a great community here for you to be part of tonight. Anyone else here for the first time? Give me a wave. Oh, God bless you. Good to have you. Shout up your names. There's only a few of us here tonight. Who are Fabina? Oh, I can't hear you, but the Lord. <laughs> God bless you. Good to have you in the house of God tonight as well. And uh, anybody online as well joining us for the first time, a very special warm welcome to you. Uh, if you're giving tithes and offerings tonight, put your hands good and high and they'll serve you with an envelope. And also the red carpet area is open for online giving. Those online as well, you're going to see the QR code and you can, you know, how to get through that and get onto the site and, and pay your tithes and offerings to the Lord or support the work here in Ireland. Um, thank you for that. For those who are watching also too, a thousand Ukrainian families are connected to the life of the church here. We give food support, pastoral care too as well. If you want to give to that work and feed Cork, you can do so online as well. So we thank God for you and for partnering with us here at the church and for the ones that are here for your faithfulness in your, in your tithes and offerings to the Lord. It's part of your worship. You do it because it's in your heart to do it. You don't do it for my benefit. You do it for the glory of God. So the Lord bless you tonight as you give your tithes and offerings. I got some announcements. We have a very busy week coming up. So um, I'd like us all to maybe get into gear for this. Uh, we have a team arriving tomorrow from Jacksonville, Florida. There's about 25 or 26 of them there. And they're wonderful people. And I know actually quite a few of them for many years. They're godly people. They've been here in the past. But they're here to do evangelism. And, you know, I'm typically saying to young adults and youth, you know, take time off work, school, or college, get embedded with the team, um, get to know them, get on the streets. We're going on the streets on Friday, doing open airs right outside um, the, uh, where are we going outside? Uh, I'm going to call it Cassius, but anyhow, 
Brown Thomas, it was called Cassius in the day. But we're going to be doing open air there on the streets. So, if you, we, you know, going to be devotions here Friday morning around 10.30. And then we're going to be hitting the streets. So if you want to come in and join for the prayer time, just come on in. You're not a stranger. You just come on in. You follow the crowd. It's in the middle of the floor. And just get involved in the prayer. Just come in and get to know the team. And let's go out and evangelize Friday. Saturday is going to be the same as well. Evangelism there. The team will also be supporting the youth ministry Friday night. And they'll be taking services both on Wednesday uh, next week and also Sunday morning. They have a pastor with them and a preacher. So we're looking forward to receiving the word of the Lord from them. So that's happening. They're going to be with young adults on Sunday night. Here's Sunday morning at 11. Prayer meetings at normal on Zoom at 7 o'clock. And everybody knows the links are on our Facebook page and our website. But the team are also running a, um, a, a, like a VBS in Cargill Line, a vacation Bible school. It's very American, but it's basically a kids club. And it's really for children uh, from school going age, I think. I uh, haven't all the details, but I've, you're going to get a lot more details uh, for the sisterhood meetings. Actually, Saturday morning as well. Sister, sisterhood, you know that's going on. The gathering for a lady Saturday morning. But you'll hear more about that kids club because we, we're, look, we're just putting out to the Cork Church people. You're expecting about 150 children already. There's a huge crowd after booking in. You don't want your own child to miss out on this. It's a Christian run camp for the week, for actually for three days. I think Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday in Cargill Line. But you have to book in online. So just check out the details. Go to the sites and you'll see where it's at. But do book your children and don't let them miss out on something that will really be good for their spiritual development. So that's happening next week. There's going to be open airs happening. There's other bits and pieces happening as well. So please keep your ear to the ground. Support it in prayer. Bless the team when they come in. You know, relate to them. Uh, let it be a good experience for them too with Cork Church. So it's going to be a busy week. So we Sunday morning, Sunday night, Monday night prayer. Uh, the VBS during the week with Wednesday night back here as normal. And, uh, and the Portuguese service again every Thursday night here, which is tomorrow night as well. 6.30, the doors open for fellowship and the service starts off at 7.30. So that's kind of everything that's going to happen for the week. Will you invite someone to church Sunday? It's going to be a great word. Invite them to Wednesday. And get along to an open air, at least for an hour, if you can, on a Friday and on a Saturday. And uh, get your kids to the VBS. So that's really last minute plug for everything. Praise the Lord. Um, I don't think of any other announcements other than to say, God is good to his servants. Amen. I'm going to pray for the offering tonight. Bow your heads with me as we thank God for his goodness to us. And as we give back to the Lord a tithe of what he's given to us. Father, it's our honor. <laughs> Lord, you're so good to us, Lord. Forgive us for not being good back. But tonight, Lord, we give out of a cheerful heart. We give for the glory of your testimony, God, for the souls of men to be saved. And we pray, Lord God, you will richly bless the giver too, Lord, in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Praise God. The ushers are going to serve you with the baskets as well there. Delighted Pastor Patrick is ministering tonight. Gives me another night off. Thank you, Jesus. I, I'm not saying that for that reason. I really love when he ministers the word of God. Come on, don't you love Pastor Patrick? Come on. Give him a clap tonight. God bless you, sir. Good to have you here. under your shirt and everything you know <laughs> i know it tickles <laughs> oh man thank god you're among friends are you able to do everything with the we'll find out <laughs> oh guys good evening how are you let's pray together lord thank you so much for this opportunity to come around your word we thank you lord that the power is in the word that you've spoken Lord, I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you're in this place already. I thank you that we carried your presence in here, Lord. And I thank you, Lord, that your heart is to move amongst your people. Lord, I think of David and how he danced before your presence and how everybody came away with something, Lord. For some, it was a flask of wine. For others, it was cakes, raisins, figs. But everybody was blessed by your presence. And Lord, I thank you, Lord, that you delight to be with your people. You're the same God.
And uh, I ask that you would use me one more time as we open up your word and as we begin to look at the amazing realities, the amazing promises and truths that are ours because we belong to you, because we're in Christ. I pray, Lord, that our hearts would lift, Lord, that we would be encouraged, Lord, and that we would leave this place energized in our faith, Lord, excited again, Lord, and that we would go out and we would be effective for you, fruitful for you. Thank you for your wonderful grace, Lord, uh, and we just bless your name. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Okay, folks, today I want to, uh, the title of my message is, Why Do Bad Things Happen to Good Grapes? Okay, so that is the stun confusion that I, I was expecting <laughs> Let's do it. I'm going to start with a quote by Oswald Chambers. If you are going to be used by God, he will take you through a number of experiences that are not meant for you personally at all. They are designed to make you useful in his hands and to enable you to understand what, uh, uh, excuse me, and enable you to understand what takes place in the lives of others. Amen. Some of you, maybe you're here today and, uh, you know, if you're like me, maybe you've asked this question more than once in your life. Why am I going through this? Why is this happening? Why is this taking place? And today, I believe the Holy Spirit wants to help us ask, answer those questions. I believe today the Holy Spirit wants to help us uh, learn how to navigate seasons where we feel like we're being crushed where we feel like we're forgotten or insignificant, when we feel shaken to the very limits of our faith. The question you might be asking is, how do I remain confident? How do I reconcile the promises of God over my life with the processes of God that are happening in my life right now? Amen. That's the tension so many of us can be living in. Lord, I know what you've spoken over my life. I know that you've promised me good things. I know that your plans for me are good and, and there's an expected end for me. Amen. Is that true tonight or no? It's true. And yet we go through processes, seasons where we can feel like we're being crushed. Amen. We can feel like we're forgotten. We can feel like we're insignificant. Amen. Like we're on the shelf, like we're aging out. Anybody feel older than they are in the house tonight? Amen. Yes, we know, we know what it's like. And there are times where we feel pushed, sifted. We feel challenged, shaken to the very core of our faith. It's true. But in all of those things, I want to encourage you that you can reconcile it to a good God. You can reconcile all those difficult experiences to a God who loves you. John chapter 2 tells us that Jesus is a winemaker. Amen. I'm not going to spend any time really in John chapter 2, only to reference this to you. Jesus is a winemaker and God is making new wine. Amen. He's making new wine. What is new wine, Patrick, you might ask? New wine is simply the anointing of God. It is resurrection, life, and power in your life, bearing out through your life. That's what God is doing. He's creating new wine. And think about wine. I know no one's ever had any wine here, but I'm sure you know somebody who's had wine. What is wine? What are the properties of wine? Depth of character right? Potency. Wine is effective. Wine has an effect on the drinker, on the consumer. And so God is looking to bring new wine out of our lives, depth of character, anointing, and effectiveness. That's what he's doing. Listen, a, a life of impact, in other words, a fruitful life. Who wants a fruitful life? Who wants to be used by God? Amen. Every last one of us, we all do. I've got a quote here by Rick Warren. Sweet wine comes from crushed grapes. Amen. If you want God's anointing on your life, expect to be crushed. Hmm. The greater the anointing on your life, the more pain you're going to go through. 
Folks, uh, um, if you thought that you were going to hear a health and wealth message tonight, I'm so very sorry. But isn't it funny how so many in the evangelical world today can't reconcile a message like this because all they're hearing is a prosperity message that tells them that you need to be healthy and wealthy and blessed all the time and that that is what God is calling you into. Listen, folks, we're going to be talking a lot about grapes. Grapes are born to die. Amen. And you and I have been born again to die to ourselves that others might benefit from the wine of resurrection life that flows through us. I hate to be the harpenter of bad news tonight, but it's the truth. Sweet wine comes from crushed grapes. And if you want God's anointing on your life, expect to be crushed. The greater the anointing on your life, the more pain you're going to go through. The grapes become wine when they are crushed. Don't ask God to use you greatly unless you are willing to suffer. It's the truth tonight, folks. Augustine said this, we too were water and he made us wine. Wonderful. Jesus is the crafter of human beings. Glory to God. He's the great winemaker. He's the one who takes the empty vats of our lives full of stagnant water, amen, and fills them with wine. What happened in an instant in John chapter 2 is a process in our lives, but it is to the same end, impact and glory for the Son of God, the great winemaker, hallelujah. He's the crafter of human beings, and grapes have, a unique, have unique properties, and they've got to go on a journey to become wine. You and I have to go on a journey to become wine. Hallelujah. We, we, we do. And it's no wonder again, as we look at the landscape today with its health and wealth message, why so many of us lack the perspective to endure the processes necessary to fill our vats with new wine. Well, if you're like me and your prayer tonight is I want others to experience the new wine out of my life that would flow out of my life. If your prayer tonight is I want to be a vessel through which the new wine of the gospel can impact many, well then this message is for you, amen? So what I'm going to look at tonight, I'm going to be a little bit unorthodox. I'm going to look at the five processes involved in making wine. And listen, if you take notes tonight and all you take down are the five steps to making wine so you can go home and make wine in your basement, shame on you. No, I'm joking. Just listen, right? Because we're going to walk through it. These processes are, uh, they're amazing and they really bear out through the scriptures. So let's go. The first step in the process of winemaking is the harvest. It's the harvest. And in order to make fine wine, grapes must be harvested at the precise time. They must be harvested. And what's interesting about this is that most vineyards, most winemakers prefer to do the choosing of grapes by hand. Amen. Psalm 136 says, with what? With outstretched arm and hand, we were saved. Hallelujah. The children of Israel, a picture of you and I out of the world, out of Egypt, we were saved. We experienced salvation. God chose us. Hallelujah. God chose us. This harvest is the first step. God, like the winemaker, he goes to the wine, to the, what, what do you even call it? What, the wine press or the, the plant that grapes grow on, vineyard. Yeah, you can tell. You can tell. I'm, I'm, this is my first time talking about this stuff. <laughs> he goes, he doesn't pick every grape, but he picks certain grapes and he does it by hand. And it's you and I. Hallelujah. That's the winemaker. And listen to this. This is so important. Deuteronomy 7 verses 6 through 8. Of all the passages, all the scriptures that talk about the call of God on every believer, to me this is the most powerful. Listen, God says this, speaking of the children of Israel, for you are a people holy to the Lord your God. Amen. It's you and I. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples on the face of the earth 
to be his treasured possession. Glory to God. When Jesus came to that vine you were growing on, he came, he saw you. By name, he called you, he picked you by hand. That's what he did. And look, verse 7, the Lord did not set his affection on you and choose you because you were more numerous than other peoples. For the, you, you are the fewest of all peoples. But look at verse 8. But it was because the Lord loved you. It was just because he loved you. Hallelujah. That was the reason. And because he was keeping the oath, he swore to your ancestors that he brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the land of slavery, from the power of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Glory to God. Glory to God. It wasn't because you were strong and numerous. It wasn't because you were, you know, First Corinthians says, consider your calling. Not many of you were of noble birth. Not many of you were good looking or gifted. Not many of you had socioeconomic standing. But God chose what was foolish and abased in the world to confound the wise. God came to you and purely on the basis of his love for you, chose you. The Bible says in Ephesians 1.4, in love, he predestined us for adoption. Glory to God. He did it in love, not because of us, but because of him. Not to be a reflection of who we were or what we could offer him, but purely as a reflection of his great love for us. And we have to understand this. If we don't know the call, if we're not confident in his great love for us, we will not be anchored, we will not remain anchored to the character of God as we go through processes like the ones we're going to describe. His calling is your anchor. Can I get an amen? He loved you just because he loved you. Oh, I'm not lovable. Doesn't matter. He loves you because he's love. Glory to God. So there is a constant. Hebrews 6 says it's a steadfast anchor to the soul. God loves you and called you purely because he's love. And we must understand this as we move forward. Hallelujah. If you're called tonight, can I get an amen? Isn't it wonderful? Whatever I am, whatever I encounter, Whatever I am, I'm loved. Whatever comes my way, I'm loved. I have a received identity. I'm loved because I'm loved, because God himself is love. Praise the Lord. This is our confidence. The next stage is crushing. Well, things were going so well. The next stage is crushing. Folks, listen, if you do not crush the grapes, you will discover that a significant number of grapes will not produce juice at all. Isn't it funny? They will stay whole while being pressed. Other grapes may only give up a marginal amount of their juice while being squeezed. This is true regardless of the type of wine, uh, uh, regardless of the type of wine press you're using. Folks, in other words, unless you're crushed, what's inside of you stays inside of you. He calls you. And then he crushes you. Folks, he calls you and then he crushes you. And there are a thousand ways crushing and pressing can enter into the life of a saint. But there's one I'm going to look at today. People. God uses people to crush you. And to me, the image of the wine being crushed under the feet of people is in a particularly poignant one because sometimes God will let people walk all over you. God will let people, you don't believe me, let me show you. God will often use people to crush you and you may be in a season of crushing. You may feel today like people are walking all over you, mistreating you, hurting you, crushing you, breaking you. Unless I crush you, you'll never, I will, you'll never release your juice. It's Psalm 66, verse 12. Listen to David. For you, O God, have tested us, and you've tried us as silver is tried. You brought us into the net. You laid a crushing burden on our backs. You let men ride over our heads. 
You let men ride over the top of us. We went through fire and through water. And yet this was David's hope and ours as well. Yet you brought us out into a place of abundance. God lets people step on people. God allows these things happen. I like to look, there's so many instances of this in the scriptures, but I want to look quickly at Genesis chapter 31. And I want to look at Jacob and I want to look at Laban. I want to look at this relationship. God in his wisdom takes a master manipulator and puts him for 20 years under the heel of an even bigger master manipulator. God calls Jacob, speaks to Jacob, and then sends him to Laban's house. And look at the passage in Genesis chapter 31. Jacob says in verse 4, So Jacob sent and called Rachel and Leah. And we know the story. I, I don't need to go into it. Jacob served seven years for, for a wife, for Rachel. And it's a, a day it passes because he loves her. And then the day after he wakes up and it's Leah. Talk about too much wine. He wakes up and it's Leah and has to work another seven years. But look at him here. So Jacob, verse four, sent and called Rachel and Leah into the field where his flock was. And he said to them, I see that your father does not regard me with favor as he did before. But the God of my fathers has been with me. You know that I've served your father with all my strength, yet your father has cheated me. Now that actually, that word means to mark or despise. Cheated me and changed my wages 10 times over 20 years. But God did not permit him to harm me. And so Jacob is in a relationship with a man whom he gives everything to. And yet the man can show him no favor. And he keeps moving the goalposts on Jacob. All sorts of things are happening. There is a crushing season that Jacob has to endure under Laban. But in it all, Jacob has great faith. He doesn't lose his faith in God. He recognizes that God is with him through it all. And in it all, God is with you too. But let me ask you this tonight. What has God permitted into the winepress of your life to crush you? What has he permitted? Saul, Penina, all these individuals in the scriptures who for a season were allowed to agitate and press down and crush on individuals. A.W. Tozer said this, it is doubtful whether God can bless a man greatly until he has hurt him deeply. And God actually rises up storms of conflict in relationships at times in order to accomplish that deeper work in our character. We cannot love our enemies in our own strength this is graduate level grace. Are you willing to enter into that school? Are you willing to take the test? If you pass, you can expect to be elevated to a new level in the kingdom. For he brings us through these tests as preparation for greater use in the kingdom. You must pass the test first. And it's interesting here, feet are preferred to machines in this crushing, pressing um, stage, too many broken seeds and skins, you see, create tannins in the wine. And tannins make the wine bitter. And tannins may make the wine acerbic. And folks, God knows exactly how to crush you in a way that will break the skin, the flesh, and release the juice but not in such a way that you become bitter and resentful. Hallelujah. It's amazing. He knows how to crush you, just how to crush you, just how much pressure, just what way to do it. And folks, tonight, maybe I'm speaking to you. The person in your life, it might be a Laban, it might be a Saul, it might be a Penina, that person is an instrument. Laban's house is a stop. It's not the end destination for you. That person is an instrument to deal with my flesh, to release what the Lord has put inside of me. That is why they've been allowed to walk over me. And folks, when you begin to understand that you're in a season of crushing, it's not a destination. And that person who might be walking over you is only an instrument that God will use to break the flesh to let the juice flow out of your life.
to get what's inside of you out of you, it releases you from bitterness. You can't resent that person. You can't have issues against that person. That person is just there as a tool. God is making new wine. And they have no power, no control of your fu- over your future. Hallelujah. Crushing happens, folks. If you're in a season of crushing, take hope tonight. Be, be encouraged tonight. The next stage is fermentation. Next stage is fermentation. Uh, you know, do you know that uh, that's really just to age the wine in the dark? It ages, it becomes alcoholic, it becomes more uh, sort of impactful, effective, and so on. Folks, do you know that the average age of productivity is 60? 60 to 70 is the average age of productivity. We live in a generation where if you're not married, if you don't have 100,000 followers on Instagram and a ministry that is, you know, reaches millions by the age of 32, you're washed up and you're over the hill and that's that. Isn't it funny how we've put such an emphasis on early success? Yet one of the processes in making new wine in the lives of a believer is for God to aid you and hide you in the dark. It's amazing. Folks, those that have aged in the dark have the most potent effect. And without fermentation, the grapes cannot affect the consumer. They can't have an impact. Believers who've had to wait, who've had to be held back, who've aged, who've matured in the dark, have the most impactful ministries. Amen. You feel old tonight in the house. You feel like you've been put on the shelf. You feel like you're in the dark. You feel like others have gone beyond you. You feel like others are beyond you and have proceeded beyond where you are. Listen, a believer is like a good wine. It gets older with age. It gets better with age, excuse me. It gets better with age. It gets better. You are getting better with age. I'd like to show you this process in the life of Joseph. And I want to look at Psalm 105, verses 18 through 19. Joseph was called, and then he was crushed by his brothers when they betrayed him. And then he was falsely accused and put in an Egyptian prison for some say up to 13 years. Psalm 105, 18 through 19 says this. They bruised his feet with fetters and placed his neck in an iron collar until the time came to fulfill his dreams. The Lord tested Joseph's character. That phrase there, he was laid in irons. It actually means, it's a Hebrew phrase, what it actually means is his soul came into iron or iron entered into his soul. What an amazing thought. Iron entered into his soul. As Joseph waited in that prison in the dark, seemingly forgotten, wrongly accused, the scriptures say, as some translations say, the word of the Lord tested him. But as he waited in the dark, something entered into his soul. Folks, listen to me. Before God can give you the weight of a position, God has to put weight inside of you so that when the position is put on you, it won't break you. So God ages believers in the dark for you to be effective in the position, in the call, in the appointment that he has for you, the purpose for your life. He has to put something on the inside of you because sometimes what you want is heavier than it looks. And so God does this to every believer that he desires to use. Joseph was hidden until he aged. He was hidden until iron entered his soul until he attained a depth of character, until he got strength, impactfulness. Before the weight of the position was put on him, God put weight inside of him. Thank God that he hides us. Thank God that he hides us in dark places and lets us age, lets us grow, deepen in our character. Moses was hidden in the dark 
for 40 years in Midian. Jesus was hidden for 30 years only to minister for three. Most of us study for three years to minister for 30. Jesus was hidden. We hear about him as a boy at 12 in the temple in Jerusalem, and then we don't hear about him again until he's 30 years old. Luke 2, the end of it tells us that Jesus went home and was submissive to his parents and that he grew in wisdom, stature, and favor before God and men. That word grew, it means to beat forward. We're going to look at it later, but it also means to mature. Amen? So he matured in wisdom and in stature and in favor. And at the right time, he was presented to Israel, ready, effective, potent to be used for God's glory. You are not forgotten. You are not passed over. In fact, the opposite is true. For every believer, the older is better. Amen. God can use you over a lifetime or he can use you a lifetime's worth in a short period of time. Thank God for that. The next stage is filtration or sifting. And filtration can be done with everything from a coarse filter that catches only large solids to a sterile filter pad that strips the wine of all life. Folks, God crushes you and then he hides you and then he ages you to increase your potency and then he shows you you. I'm going to show you this here. He shakes you or sifts you and he does it to increase your dependency. I want to look today at Peter from Luke chapter 22, verses 31 through 34. I want to show you this filtering process that even after wine has been aged, God filters or the wine is filtered by the winemaker to take impurities out. And I'll show you exactly what's going on here. Verse 31, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you all as weeds. But I've prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you've turned back, strengthen your brothers. Peter said to him, Lord, I'm ready to go with you, both to prison and to death. And Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny me three times or deny three times that you know me. You know, that word sift there, it, it's the same idea as filtration. It means to... Uh, to sift by inward agitation, to try one's faith to the verge of overthrow by trial and temptation. It's a very particular process, folks, a very particular one. And I want to say this tonight, the greatest trials are the ones that show you your own fragility. They're the greatest trials in life, the ones that shake you from the inside. That's exactly what would happen to Peter Peter had nothing but proclamations about his own passion and about his own zeal and about his own love for Jesus. But underneath all of that, what had to be filtered out was self-dependency, a sense of self-dependency that that he had. He believed that it was about his own strength. He didn't understand yet that it was about weakness and it was about dependency. Dependency. And the truth is this, Peter had to fall. Peter had to fail because unless he did, there would be no sermon at Pentecost. Peter would never have gotten up 50 days later to proclaim Jesus after the coming of the Holy Spirit. You see, it can't be about zeal and about gifts and about dedication because our strength will always fail. After that night, Peter knew that if anything would become of his life, it would be because he was visited, touched by power outside of himself. He had to go through trials, temptations, face his own failure to understand that those things had to, they had to be purged out of him. All self-confidence, self-dependence has to be sifted out of us as well. At the bottom of Peter's proclamations of loyalty lay self-sufficiency. I wonder if it's true for you or for me today. And it had to be filtered out and God used failure to do it. What shakes you makes you. Amen. The trials, the tempt- the things you deal with, they make you. And those who've been shaken... Live in dependency. 
And you might feel weak or unworthy. You might feel shaken by what you're facing. You might be facing your own failure. But you need to understand tonight that although your strength is small, there is one praying for you. There is one whose, whose strength will never fail. There is one who's in the heavenlies interceding on your behalf. Sifting brings you into an understanding. I have nothing to bring. It's about him. It's about his power. It's about his working. It's about the new wine of his grace flowing through me. I may have gifts. I may have a call. I may have been put in the dark to age and mature. But if it's not about dependency, it's not going to happen. I will lean on his strength, on his faithfulness, and on his love. The final, the final stage is the one that I think we're all most excited about. And it's the bottling, it's the serving, it's the season of appointing. After seasons of crushing and fermenting and sifting, there comes a season of appointing. Once the processes have been done, once you have come through the processes, the wine can be served. And fully matured, it will have its desired effect and impact. Behind every impactful ministry, behind every fruitful life, there has been crushing and fermenting and sifting. Listen to me, saints. Listen to me tonight. If you are being crushed, if you are being sifted, if you are hidden right now, understand it is the very working of God to bring a wine, a grace out of your life that will bless other people. This is not for you. So many of us take these things personal. We think God is abandoning us. We think God has forgotten us, but it's not about us. These processes are there to bring the new wine out so that others will experience his grace through our lives. At a certain point, David was appointed king. At a certain point, Joseph was appointed ruler over Egypt. And all God had done in the dark bore out in the light for his glory. I'd like to just get a little bit more practical right now before I close. We need to have a confidence in these processes. We need to have a confidence in crushing, in our calling. We need to go back. If, you have, if you're here tonight and you don't have that confidence, you can't understand why these things are happening to you. And you're struggling with the processes you're going through in life right now. My encouragement to you is to go back to the anchor. To go back to the calling. And I want to show you from Second Peter chapter 1 how to live in the calling. And I'd like to read from the Amplified Version because I think it's so good. For by these he's bestowed on us his precious and magnificent promises of inexpressible value, so that by them you may escape from the immoral freedom that is in the world because of disreputable desire and become sharers of the divine nature. For this very reason, applying your diligence to the divine promises, make every effort in exercising your faith. That's the first thing. Continue to exercise your faith. And then it goes on, develop moral excellence, and in moral excellence, knowledge, which is insight or understanding, and in your knowledge, self-control, and in your self-control, steadfastness, and in your steadfastness, godliness, and in your godliness, brotherly affection, and in your brotherly affection, which is uh, develop Christian love. That is, learn to unselfishly seek the best for others and do things for their benefit, right? For as these qualities are yours and are increasing in you as you grow towards spiritual maturity, they will keep you from being useless and unproductive in regard to the true knowledge and greater understanding of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? And look at verse 10. Therefore, believers, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you. And this is it. Listen, be 
be sure that your behavior reflects and conforms your relationship with God. For by doing these things, actively developing these virtues, you will never stumble in your spiritual growth and live a life that leads others away from sin. In other words, Peter lays out things that we can walk in that confirm that we are called of God. And by doing them in these processes, we actually begin to prove out or bear out the new wine in our lives. Let me show you here. Let me, let me break it down a little bit more. Because you're called, they're yours already. Okay, so in verse 3, it says that we've received everything pertaining to life and godliness. The spirit in you, because you've been called by God, is the evidence that you belong to him, but it is also the very presence inside of you that assures that you already have these things. They're already yours. Moral excellence, knowledge, self-control, patient endurance, godliness, brotherly affection, and love for all. They're actually the fruit of your calling. They are, they are there, the presence of them in your life is there because the Spirit of God is inside of you. So Peter is saying, exercise them like you would a muscle. They're yours, walk in them. So although I'm being crushed, because the Spirit of God is in me due to my calling, I do have moral excellence. I do have a knowledge of God. I do have self-control. I do have patient endurance, godliness, brotherly affection, and love for all believers. They're not something I need to sort of reach out and find outside of myself. Because I'm called by God, they're already in me. I can live this way even in the pressing, even in the crushing, even in the fermentation, even when people forget me or overlook me, even in Laban's house, even through it all, I can do this. They are mine in my crushing. And like a muscle, they grow by doing, by exercise. And Peter says, if you will walk out what's already yours, you will prove the call on your life in time. It's already yours. You have everything you need to bear fruit even in crushing. You will navigate the crushing, the fermenting, the sifting, and you'll complete the call. I'd like to end by saying this to you. Jesus was born to die. Amen? He was crushed by his father as the weight of sin, of our sin, was placed upon him. He was hidden for 18 years in submission where we grew in wisdom and stature and favor before God and men. And he was sifted in the garden, sifted in Gethsemane when he yielded himself to the will of the Father and the cup of suffering that was his to partake in. And it was all so that we could be filled with this new wine. Jesus calls us to walk in those footsteps. Amen. He calls us to those things. Why? Because the new wine is worth the process. If I could get you just to embrace that simple thought tonight as we close. The new wine is worth the process. I want others to experience the new wine through my life. I do. I don't want to sit on the vine, a fat grape, and never impact anybody. Ever. Ever. I don't. I want to be a vessel through which the new wine of the gospel can affect many lives. That's what I want. And I, I want to just, as I hand it over to Pastor Nick, there's a song by Hillsong called New Wine. I'd like to read some of the lyrics. It won't take long. And then I'm going to hand it over to Pastor Nick to pray. But let it be a, a prayer in your heart as I read it. Let the lyrics resonate in you. I want this new wine, Lord. I understand you're the winemaker. I get the processes now. But listen to the lyrics. In the crushing, in the pressing, you are making new wine. In the soil, I now surrender. You are breaking new ground. So I yield to you into your careful hand. When I trust you, I don't need to understand. Make me your vessel. Make me an offering. 
Make me whatever you want me to be. I came here with nothing but all you have given me. Jesus, bring new wine out of me. Because where there is new wine, there is new power, there is new freedom, and the kingdom is here. I lay down my old flames to carry your new wine today, your new fire today. Let that be our prayer tonight. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Pastor Nick. Praise the Lord. Thank you so much. As Pastor Patrick was preaching, I was jotting down some thoughts here because it was come to me fast and furious. You know, why God even compares uh, wine to the secular wine. You know, the, we know what wine in the natural can do to a man or a woman. Why would God even compare us to wine? You ever worry about, do you ever sit down and think about that? Why would God compare us to wine? I just wrote down some thoughts. Man, man's wine tastes good, but takes away control. God's wine tastes great and gives self-control. Man wine, man's wine brings temporary joy, but a morning of regret and often, often, often time a lifetime of regret. God's wine gives joy unspeakable and full of glory. Man's wine can give temporary healing to the odd ailment. They say, take a little wine for your stomach. But I want to say, God's wine produces life and health and peace. Man's wine makes you a slave to your flesh, but God's wine sets you free from the power of the flesh. Man's wine is pretentious. It never lives up to its lost, lofty promises. God's wine quenches every thirst, heals every wound, and brings love, joy, peace, kindness, meekness, self, gentleness, and self-control. And that's why God is saying the world has its wine, and it goes through all its processes, but I have my wine, and you too will go through your process. And you will be, as, as the Apostle Paul said, I could drink offering poured out upon that sacrifice for him. Amen. Thank God today that we don't have the wine of the world. We have the wine of the Spirit. Amen. And God is producing that in you, in and me, and through much trial. And you have no idea because you were out at the first part of the service. I started reading from Psalm 119, which I'll finish the rest of this, not the whole 119. Let me start where I started from. Lord, you have treated your servant well, just as you promised. Teach me good judgment and discernment, for I rely on your commands. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. You are good, and you do, and you do what is good. Teach me your statutes. The arrogant have smeared me with lies, but I obey your precepts with all my heart. Their hearts are hard and insensitive, but I delight in your instructions. It was good for me to be afflicted so that I could learn your ways. Instruction from your lips is better for me than a thousand pieces of gold and silver. In that crushing in our lives, in that breaking in our lives, there is the producing of, of a heavenly wine that is so superior to the earthly wine, so, so superior to the, to, to the potentious wine and celebration of this world, because it is. We have men and women here today in this house even, that could tell you, I had a, not a belly full of that wine, and it left me broken. But now the Holy Spirit is doing a work in me, a wine that is beautiful, a wine that is fragrant, a wine that is healing. And if I should only yield to the process, and that sometimes it's, as you said, Pastor, it's sometimes it's in those dark places where you feel like you're stuck in a vat somewhere, <laughs> just on my own, and God is saying, I'm doing a work in you. And when I present you to this world, you will be a wine to them of healing and joy and peace and kindness and meekness and gentleness and self-control. Thank God today that the heavenly wine that God has started in your life is so much greater than the wine that we were saved from. Can you say amen? Can you stand with me tonight as we just close in prayer and say, Lord, with all its difficulties, with all the pressings and all the people that walk on me and all the attacks that come against me, I want to say, as David said, I was glad when you afflicted me, for I learned your ways. I heard your voice. So whatever you're going through to tonight, it really is that sense of truly laying down the argument in your heart and say, Lord, I know you're at work in my life. 
and what's being produced is going to be beautiful and pleasing and a blessing to this world around me. And Father, we thank you tonight, Lord, that through many, many difficulties, Lord, but Lord Jesus, you are there through every stage of that journey, Lord. You handpicked us. You came to the harvest. You took us, Lord. You brought us to places, Lord, to squeeze us, Lord, with no any bitterness left in our hearts. Sometimes, Lord, you put us into a place, Lord, where things had to be, a depth had to be put into us, Lord, a, a, an ability to have real effect upon the world. And then, Lord, it was a releasing time and a presenting time. And I pray, Father God, this could be the time for us tonight, Lord, that we would be soon to be presented to this world, oh God, as a, Lord, as a, as, as a, a true reflection of your mighty miracles in our lives. And I pray that for my own life, Lord, that I would be a reflection of you, Father. Lord Jesus, that I would be a true reflection and representation of all that you are. Make that in me today, O oh God, whatever it's needed, whatever you need to do, Father, I surrender into the hands of Almighty God. I don't want to be, Lord, some innocuous, Lord, some, Lord, uh, uh, Lord toxic drink, Lord, what that would bring bitterness, Lord, and regret. But, Lord, I want to be something, Lord, as someone that would, Lord, bring the rivers of life, Lord, the wine of the Spirit. Please hear us tonight, Lord. We thank you so much for what you're doing in our lives. We bless you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Let's give the Lord praise tonight. God bless you. What a great, <laughs> tremendous, tremendous word tonight. The Lord bless you. Please stay around for teas and coffees tonight as well, the folks downstairs on the ground floor. And those watching online, the Lord bless you. Have a wonderful week. Just don't forget to be here on Sunday morning with us as well as we go live. And again, for the congregation, just remember this week's evangelism. And ladies, of course, sisterhood on, on Saturday morning for the ladies' breakfast morning here at Cork Church. It's going to be a great morning. Make sure you attend that. The Lord will bless you. Amen.